So without further ado, we're going to welcome the Clotilda Descendant Association, and they're going to introduce themselves. So Jeremy, let's start with you. Absolutely. First, let me just say thank you, Whitney. Thank you to Dr. Matthews, who I've had the privilege of meeting and corresponding with. Hello to everyone in the conference room. And just thank my fellow descendants who are joining me today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Ellis. I am a direct descendant of Kupoli, Poli, and Rose Allen, who are two of the survivors of Boric Clotilda. I am also the current president of the Clotilda Descendants Association. And it is always an honor and a privilege when I get to share the story of, of our ancestors and continuously inform the world of, of their resiliency and their strength and courage. So I'm honored to be here today, to be a part of this panel and to share their stories as well as what we are doing in the Clotilda Descendants Association. So thank you, Whitney. And thank you to the International African American Museum for, for having us today. And then Alta Viz, do you want to go next? Yes, I will. Perfect pronunciation <laughs> with me. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Um, Happy New Year. Um, my name is Alta Viz Rosario. I am the vice president of the Clotilda Descendants Association and a proud sixth generation descendant of uh, Kosala Aluale, whose enslaved name is Kajo Lewis, and um, Abali Lewis, who unfortunately is not as well known or talked about as often as her husband, Kujo. Um, I would like to echo Jeremy's thanks and sentiments uh, to everyone. Um, we are always very privileged to be able to share our ancestors' story. So thank you for having me. And then Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. I echo uh, my fellow uh, panelists on uh, thanking you for the opportunity for presenting today. My name is William Bill Green. I am a third generation descendant of O.C., spelled O-S-I-A, and Ina, spelled I-N-N-I-E, Kibi. I am a native of Africatown, Alabama, a section of Mobile. It, I was, uh, first four years of my life, I spent in the new quarters, so named as a euphemism for the new slave quarters. And I am um, I am currently residing in Texas, and it's a pleasure to be on the panel. I serve as the treasurer of the Clotilda Descendants Association. And with that, I pass it back to you, Sweet. So let's, let's start off with what was the Clotilda? When did it happen? And some background of it. Uh, absolutely. So, again, um, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share the story of our ancestors. And it's important that um, as part of us telling this story, we tell as many of the individual stories of the survivors of that horrific voyage. Um, but it's important also as I've had the opportunity to travel around not only the state of Alabama, but just um, different states in, in the United States, a lot of people aren't familiar with this story. So in order for you all to have a full grasp of this, uh, the truth, um, it's not a story, it's the truth of the 110. Uh, I am gonna go through a few slides. Hopefully you all can see can see my screen. Can everyone see my screen? And yeah. it'll be a, I don't wanna really present it per se. Uh, it should be more of a dialogue. If there are questions, definitely ping those in the window. And Bill and Altavis, feel free to share anything that you want to elaborate on as we go through these particular slides. Um, so this is the truth of the 110 uh, survivors aboard, aboard Clotilde. It's not a story, it's the truth. Um, next slide. Before I actually get into the truth uh, around the, the 110, we are the Clotilda Descendants Association and our mission 
is to honor our ancestors, preserve our cultural landmarks and legacies, and educate future generations of descendants and the community. And we do that through our various objectives that happen each, um, each year. Um, one of those is actually approaching, and that's the Spirit of Our Ancestors Festival, which will be taking place in Mobile, Alabama, um, on the weekend of September, uh, I'm sorry, February. February 3rd. So if you all are interested, we invite you down to Mobile. Um, there'll be some events leading up to that weekend, but definitely a way to come down. You can see An Ocean in My Bones, which is a play written and directed by Terrence Spivey, as well as meet several of the families associated with this story. Our vision is to create a global network of descendants who work together to preserve and continue the legacy of our ancestors. And so um, that's what our organization is actively doing. Uh, we want to continue to grow this organization and continue to allow descendants to tell their family stories. And so that's who we are as an organization. So in order to understand the truth of this particular story, you first have to understand what was going on in American history. So in, uh, about 12.7 million Africans were subject to the transatlantic slave trade. 10.7 million arrived. That means that 2 million died in transit. Uh, transatlantic, uh, the Middle Passage transatlantic slave trade was one of the most horrific um, inhumane um, in American history. And so to know that 2 million didn't even make the transit is, is, is horrific within itself. In 1808, Transatlantic Slave Trade Act took effect. So what that means is that on January 1st, 1808, and if you were caught participating in the Transatlantic Slave Trade, um, that was it was illegal. And so in 1820, the Piracy Act took to protect the commerce of the United States and punish the crime of, um, so essentially if you were caught participating, that was punishable by, by death. So they abolished the transatlantic slave trade in 1808. In 1820, they amended the Piracy the Act, which means that if you were caught, um, that was punishable by death and was typically being hung. Um, why is that significant? That's significant because the story of our ancestors would take place 50 years after the abolishment of the slave, slave, uh, transatlantic slave trade and 40 years after the amendment of the Piracy Act. So this was illegal. Mm -hmm. And so we know that this was illegal and that a crime was committed. Understand Mobile history. You got to know what was going on in Mobile at the time, the incentive. So antebellum, 1820 to 1860, Cotton was king. Everybody knows that the cotton industry was booming. Um, it was high commerce in Mobile at the time. And Mobile was one of the fourth busiest ports in the U.S. By 1850, it was the second largest international seaport to the Gulf Coast after New Orleans. And why is that relevant? Because it was booming. Um, some called it the Paris of its day. Um, and so that was the incentive for what would initial, what would eventually be the arrival of our ancestors. And so um, that was the, the driving force around Clotilda's final voyage. Uh, folklore. I call this folklore um, because through my research, uh, what I've learned is that when we simplify this crime to a folklore, it really takes away the sophistication of what actually happened. This was a well thought out, sophisticated plan by conspirators Timothy Mayer and Captain William Foster. Um, but the folklore around there being a bet um, and Timothy Mayer being one of the most wealth wealthiest businessmen in Mobile at the time, that family is still one of the five wealthiest families in Mobile. Um, he allegedly wagered seven Northern businessmen a $1,000, uh, which in that time is equivalent to, to, to millions today, but he would, uh, that he could smuggle 
um, a cargo of Africans in, in Mobile. Um, I actually did a interview with James Delgado, who is one of the prominent archaeologists who's done the study of Clotilda. He's written uh, just this past year a book around Clotilda's multiple journeys. Um, it's very fascinating because it also speaks to how involved mobile ports were in just international um, trading and how important mobile was in the international trade port. But in, in uh, through conversations with, uh, with um, Dr. Delgado, um, he talks about how Timothy Mayer and Clotilda would travel to different seaports in both Florida and in the Caribbean and how they would see enslaved folks essentially um, unloading and loading those ships. And, and from that observation, we believe that that could have been, or, or the theory is that that was one of the driving forces behind Clotilda's last voyage. And so, although they say it's the bet, um, I think that actually simplifies the crime that mm -hmm. actually took place. Um, so, um, Timothy Mayer is one of the protagonists in this story. Captain William Foster is another one. Um, or right around March, uh, it's really right around the late February, early March 4th, um, Clotilda would make its final voyage. And so Clotilda would leave Mobile and it would travel to the west coast of Africa, now known as the Kingdom of Dahomey. Um, a few things I like to point out on this particular slide is that from cradle to grave, Clotilda was involved in the slaves of land and in, in, uh, in the business of slavery. Um, Clotilda was built by enslaved folk. Um, it was maintained by enslaved folk, and its final voyage would be that of carrying our ancestors over. So from the cradle to the grave, Clotilda was involved. Uh, why is this significant? Because it during Captain Foster's actual voyage over to West Africa, he actually would experience what we now know as, as hurricanes, but he would have some very strong winds, so much so that the ship actually got damaged during the voyage to the west coast of Africa. Um, and, and he was also chased several times, at least three times by Portuguese warships on his way to West Africa. And so he knew, number one, what he was doing was illegal. Number two, he also knew that this just shows his determined, how determined they were to fulfill this particular journey. And so I like to point out the hurricanes. I like to point out the being chased by the Portuguese warships in the Atlantic Ocean. And he, all, he almost experienced a mutiny. Um, a lot of folks don't talk about that, but he, um, when they originally left, they did not inform the crew of this particular voyage. And so there was almost a, a mutiny that took place. He would eventually convince them that he would pay them more money when they return, which he did not do. But that's what he told them in order to not experience that mutiny, um, et cetera. Next slide. So when he arrived, he would arrive and actually he would spend, it was, it was actually tradition and custom, but he would spend nine days before he actually would make his final purchase and he would leave. Um, uh, what a lot of people don't know is that when he arrived in the West Coast of Africa, you could not dock your ships at port. You would actually dock those out at sea. And then the um, uh, the Homian warriors would actually canoe and would get the, the those that were looking to do business with them, in this case, Captain Foster, and they would canoe them over to their kingdom. And he actually would spend around, uh, right around nine days before he completed his voyage. Um, a few things, uh, he would actually purchase 125 Africans. Most folks don't, don't, don't know that. Um, and I'll speak to how he only left with 110, but it's important that we pause here because this is really what this story is about, right? 
Um, it's really this story is about those 125 rafters, now the 110, um, and and who they were. Uh, we know that they were from different countries. Um, the youngest was as young as two. Think about that. Um, the youngest that would um, be a part of this final voyage was two years old, and we believe the oldest was around 23. For for every female he would um, that he would select, he would also select the male because obviously he wanted to reproduce and he wanted to continue to um, have more enslaved folks. Um, they were married with children. They were from different occupations. And that's what makes the CDA so so significant is that um, our members can tell their family story because that's what this is all about. It's not about a ship. It's not about anything other than those 110 survivors and what they experienced. They had different occupations um, in West Africa. They were from, some were worked in the market, some were soldiers, some were travelers, but they each had occupations prior to being captured by the Dahomean warriors and then sold into captivity to Captain Foster. Captain Foster would only leave with 110 of the captives. Um, if you all recall, when I when I told the story, they would not um, port at, they wouldn't, uh, Clotilda was not docked at the port. It was docked in the sea. And so they would load about 35 Africans onto these canoes and they would um, essentially load about 35 at a time. And actually my next slide shows you a picture. I actually own this piece of art, but um, they would load. This is why I actually purchased this. Uh, this art is by um, Kadar Nelson. Um, this was featured in National Geographic, but um, I actually purchased this particular piece because of its accuracy but they would actually load about 35 onto these canoes and then they would load them onto um, Clotilda in this case. Well, right when they had just loaded um, 75, they, had, they were about to load the next 35 and they saw um, a British warship patrolling the Atlantic Ocean. And because they saw that British warship patrolling the Atlantic Ocean, they would leave behind 15 of them. Um, they would only um, actually bring with them 35, uh, 110 of the 125 that he purchased. Um, William Green, um, um, his ancestor has a great story and Cujo and, um, and so does um, Altavis. They have a great connection that I hope they're able to tell about this particular interaction uh, with their families. But he would leave with 110. They would put them into the cargo hold of Clotilda. Um, I kind of, there's a lot of details in the weeds of, of this particular story. I'm definitely giving you all the, the highlights. But but they were, Clotilda, when it was built, it was, it was a customized, well-built schooner. And so they would put them in the cargo hold for 13 days. It's, imagine this, um, these enslaved folks now who had never really been in the ocean were in this cargo hold. They would be placed in there side by side on their sides. And they would, it's, for the first 13 days, they would be in that position where they ate, slept, uh, vomited, women on their menstrual cycles experiencing that. Um, these are as young as two-year-olds in this cargo hold, not you know, in an unknown place, going to an unknown location. That's important because people need to understand how inhumane this experience was for them. They were stripped of their clothes. Um, Cujo talks about in Barracoon, how that haunted them until the day that they died is how they were stripped of their clothes before they were actually put onto Clotilda and, and what that experience was like, like for them. There's several different interviews that were done and I'm about to wrap up so we can get to Q and A, but there were several different interviews that had been done uh, in the later years of many of the survivors. And when they talk about that experience, 
They really talk about how brutal it was. Abachi Turner described laying in the filth and darkness of Clotilda's hole, gasping for breath, praying for a drop of water. Uh, Matilda McCrary, who was two at the time, imagine this, a two-year-old who was kidnapped from her mother and sister. She was sold with her mother while her two sisters were sold separately. And she told stories about her and her sisters clinging, terrified to their mother and Clotilda Carvajal, a two-year-old. Let's just pause and let that resonate, right? Because we can't skip over this. A lot of times people don't talk about the transatlantic slave trade, they can't, we can go back to, this is why this story is so significant, right? This is the only story where you have documented interviews from both the conspirators, which are Timothy Mayer, uh, Captain Foster and his diary, but you also have interviews from those that were enslaved, the survivors. We have written documentation from Cujo Lewis with via his interview with Zora Neale Hurston. We have documented interviews with Matilda McCrary, who was two, who can speak about her experience in the transatlantic slave trade. That's significant. That's world history. And so you have these this two-year-old who is now old enough to explain to you what it was like in that particular cargo hold. Um, I'm going to wrap up with this slide here that really just speaks to when they arrived this picture was taken out by the actual location of Clotilda. And the reason I, why I took this picture was because it, it shows you what they experienced when they arrived. These folks are naked, have been on in the cargo hold of Clotilda for 45 days. And now they have arrived to a location where it's the summer of Immobile around July the 8th. It's hot, humid. Uh, Charleston, I've been there in the summer. It's hot and humid. <laughs> um, so imagine arriving there, no clothes on, mosquitoes, moccasins, alligators in those waters. And now they're being taken off of Clotilda and transported onto the steamboat Czar, uh, which is also owned by Captain Foster and hidden underneath um, a plantation home. And so that's what they experienced. And so... This story really is about, or this truth is really about those 110 survivors, the community that they built, as well as what they experienced. And so I'm going to stop there because I've given you a lot of information, but that is just really to give you context into who these resilient individuals were and what they experienced and what they would accomplish post-1860 and post-1865 when they learned of their freedom. So I'll pause there. Alta V's bill, feel free to add any any nuggets that you feel like was left out. No, you you were quite thorough and and your presentation there, and it uh, encapsulates better than individual words can. Thank you so much for that, Jeremy. Agreed, absolutely. The um, And, and I, I do appreciate how you express that we we need to first the attention needs to be on the people first 110 and then just to truly just sit in their experience because when there is the conversation about the transatlantic slave trade um not a lot of time is spent with folks sitting in the deprivation that these people were forced to experience so thank you Absolutely. And and I'll and I'll say this. There's actually, and for those that are interested in really learning about that, um James Delgado and I did a conversation around what that experience was like through his archaeological lens. It's pretty emotional. As well as Kamal Siddiqui did a uh, a sit down with me. Um, about his experience diving Clotilda. And for those that really want to understand what that experience would have been like, I really recommend it because it's important that we don't, and that's what I, even when I'm just telling the story of my own ancestors, um, a lot of times folks talk about slavery and theory, mm -hmm. which is why it's important that when we tell our stories, 
we being the descendants of the 110, we can put a name to those individuals who experience slavery. Right. And in this case, also, like Altavi just said, we can put a name to what their experience was like in the transatlantic slave trade. And that's right. very important. So I wanted to, to elaborate on that point as well. Yeah, that name is just has so much like emphasis and just makes it more emotional having an actual name to a story of Absolutely. a person. It pulls on that emotional heartstring more than with this without that name. Mm -hmm. So with the names and those stories of the transatlantic slave trade, I would love if each of y'all can share about your ancestors journey on the Cantilda and maybe some stories and how that history had been able to be preserved and passed down to now from that time, because those stories are far from for between. We don't have a lot of them with a different people. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I'll start. Uh, my um, ancestor, Kajo, uh, his story is the most well-documented uh, thus far. Um, he, uh, as I said, I'm um, sixth generation. Um, he and Abilie had six children of their six children. Only one, um, Alec, had children. He had four children of his four children. Only two had children. Um, and um, and uh, um, of those two children, which were um, my great-grandmother, um, uh, um, Angeli and her brother, Johnny, they then had um, a series of children, one of which my grandmother, um, who's pictured uh, behind me, she and her twin sister, Mary, my grandmother, Mary, and her twin sister, Martha, um, are the two little girls that you often see in pictures featured with Kajo. And then, you know, my mother, Cheryl, and myself. Um, my grandmother, uh, fortunately, because Kajo lived um, very a, a very long life, my grandmother was around 12, 13 when he passed away. And he was an integral um, member of her family and raised her alongside of, because it was truly a, when, when we hear the adage, it takes a village to raise um, a child. That was their lived experience. Um, they were fortunate enough to live in a village, to live in their own crafted tribe, to where, you know, they all took care of each other. And so Kudjo was instrumental in the raising of my grandmother. My grandmother sat at his feet and listened to firsthand accounts of his life, of the attack. Um, and how he lived pre-slavery and then post-slavery. And that story was trickled down to my mother, my uncle, myself, my sibling, my cousins, um, because Kudjo instilled in all of his descendants that it was important to not only know our story, but to pass it on. He was proud of his heritage, of his life, of his survivorship, um, of what he was able to accomplish post-slavery and in spite of all of the challenges for an African in America. And, and it was key that he pass that on to all of his descendants and ensure that they understood the importance of passing it on. Um, as I said, I sat at my grandmother's knee to hear stories of him and our family in the same way that she sat at Kudjo's um, knee. And I did the same for my daughter and my sibling and my cousins did the same. Um, so, you know, we, we have always understood the pride of our history and the significance in passing that along. Well, I, I'll go next. Um, as I said, I'm a third generation descendant of OC9 Akibi. I'm the eldest statesman of the group. So third generation, you're not far removed. Uh, they would be my great grandparents. Uh, their daughter, Sarah Kibi, was my grandmother and one of her sons, Fred Green, was my father. So it was very close to the source. 
Now, as far as having personal knowledge of it, our family was perhaps a bit different than the rest. Uh, the description of their life in Africa, the capture, the internment in Stockades, the journey to America and their early life in America, of course, is best captured in the book by Zora Neale Hurston, uh, Barracoon. So, and and thanks to Altavis's uh, relative uh, ancestor, Akadjo Lewis, we have that record. And the connection that uh, Jeremy uh, referred to between the Kibi family and the uh, Kudjo Lewis was that it tells a story that uh, when they were loading the last boat to avoid uh, the capture and, and piracy, uh, riding down on the longboats as they was taking the uh, captives out to the uh, flotilla, uh, Kudjo sees his friend. He says, his friend, I see my friend Kibi in the boat. And I said, me want to go too. And with that, they grabbed him and put him on the last boat going to the Clotilda. But for that, he may have never come to these shores of America. So there's a, a, a long history of their close friendship, as well as uh, O.C.'s uh, marriage, second marriage. Uh, I have a copy of, of that document. And the witness to that was Kudjo Lewis. So there was a, a very strong, close relationship to that. Now, as I said, I have no personal knowledge of it. My grandmother was their daughter. Uh, my father, it was his practice that he would take all our young children uh, Sunday after church. He would take us to his to visit with his mother, Mama Sarah. But yeah, as young kids being, uh, we had no desire to sit around and listen to old folks talk. So we were out running about. But uh, I, uh, I think about the wealth of information that she could have shared with us. If, uh, if if at that time we had the attitude that we currently have now. So uh, uh, young ones, sit down and listen to your older folks sometimes. There, uh, there is some information that uh, you will long for as you grow older. I'll pass back to you, Whitney. Jeremy, do you wanna add to it anything? No, I think both did a good job. I think for me, well, two things. It's important that, and through my through my research, <clears throat> excuse me, through my research, I've been able to learn a lot about my ancestor, um, Poli. But there's not a lot of information about the women that were aboard Clotilda, which is something that the Descendants Association has been trying to do through conversations with. Um, the Mayor family and those involved in this this um, truth. And so um, you'll hear a lot of the, uh, when folks tell their stories, um, they speak about the men, um, but there's not a lot of story about, about the women. And so we've been trying to um, do the best. I know Miss Pat Frazier tells the story of her ancestor, Lottie Dennison, um, but um, I just think it's important that we continue not only to tell the story of the men, but also tell the story or, of the women that were aboard, aboard Clotilda. Is there a specific story either about the journey or once they got to Alabama and their life in Alabama being during around the Civil War time, even after the Civil War, that what y'all are willing to share about your ancestor? I, I have I have one that I think is important given the current climate that we're in. And if it's okay with the panelists, I like to share share that story. Um, it, it's a story about um, in 1865, they um, would learn of their freedom, April 12, 1865. Um, Many of them will become U.S. citizens for the first time in uh, 1868. The men will become U.S. citizens in 1868. But they would actually cast their first and only ballot around um, 1874. And so they actually would vote for the first time in, in that election. And so the story goes that uh, I believe it was Poli. Actually, I think it was the three represented on this call. Poli, Kibi, and Cujo traveled to 
the balloting location to cast their first ballot. And when they arrived, um, Captain Foster was there wait. Uh, I'm sorry, Ca uh, Timothy Mayor was there waiting on them. And so they walked in, they wanted to vote, and they were turned away. Uh, Timothy Mayor, um, uh, as is documented, would say they're not U.S. citizens, they're Africans, and they shouldn't be allowed to vote. And so we know that that's not true because in 1868, they actually would become U.S. citizens. So they were turned away from that polling location. Um, they would walk another five miles to the next polling location. They understood the importance of democracy and casting their first ballot. And so they actually would walk another 10 miles, I'm sorry, five miles to the next polling location. Timothy Mayer knew his he knew these individuals and how determined they were. So on horseback, he would beat them to that second location. And he would do the same thing. He would say, hey, they're, they're not U.S. citizens. They're Africans. They're not allowed to vote. And they would be turned away a second time. So the story goes, um, still determined to cast that, that, that ballot. They looked into the sky. They prayed to, to their God and said, hey, we want to be able to vote. And on the third try, they would travel to their another location, um, polling location, where they, where they would be forced to pay a dollar, so a poll tax, and they would cast their their first and what we believe to be their only only ballot um, because we know what happened after after that with the black codes and everything. So um they would they would actually vote um during that time and so that's important right because to understand to only have been here for um 14 years at that uh 14 years at that particular point in time but to only have been citizens around nine to ten years and for them to understand the importance of the democratic process and voting is something that I teach my four-year-old daughter um, today. She actually goes with me, whether it's a local, um, 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 whether it's a local election or it's a presidential election, no matter the, the election cycle, um, it's important that I engrave in her uh, the, to participate in this process. Um, her ancestors understood that and so that's something that we do as a family each and every year. And I don't know if Bill and Alta Beast has another story, but I, I like to tell that one because of, especially with the current climate that we're in and with everything that's going on with democracy, it's important that we continue to champion and, and, and educate those that are not familiar with how um, our ancestors who at one point didn't have the privilege to vote now have that privilege to vote. I don't know that I have, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, that's not true. Uh, the, the, of all of the stories of all of the mm -hmm. information that I know about my ancestor, um, I would have to say one of the most significant and pivotal stories that, I have is actually the one that Bill shared um, when they were on the coast of Wida and and when Cujo called out to um, Osa, I think about that moment and how he <clears throat> was going to be left ashore. Had he not called out to his friend, that, that one uh, moment, had he not done that, I would not be here. My family would not exist as, excuse me, as it currently exists because he would not have been taken. He would not have married um, Abilene. They would not have had their children and so on and so forth. So that it just, and that moment shows you, shows me how significant everything is that we do even something that we consider minor has effects, has 
proverbial rippling effects throughout our lives and the lives of individuals that we touch. Um, and because of that, we need to be intentional in how we move and how we, because we impact the lives of others. And the brilliancy, uh, and this is, I see Cujo behind Altavisa's shoulder. Uh, great product placement there. Uh, <laughs> so this is always here. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm no, just, I know. <laughs> but, but I'm actually going to speak to the br brilliancy of Cujo to understand the importance um, of, of, of those interviews he did with Zora Neale Hurston. Yeah. I mean... That's that's brilliancy to understand how, and even looking back to the day, how he was intentional with his with his words, mm -hmm. and they were intentional about, and Zora Neale Hurston was intentional about not changing his dialect in the book, which is why it didn't go out for so many years. Yeah. Remaining on yeah. they wanted to change the words um, and his dialect, and so to me. The fact that Cujo, as an example, um, understood to have these interviews and to sit down with Zora Neale Hurston, as well as they did with, we talk about Zora Neale Hurston, but they also met with um, Emma, Emma Roach yes. in historic sketches. Um, that's where my ancestor, Paul Lee, was interviewed, and he's discussed, and the pictures that we have of him are from Emma Roach, who if we had not, if they had not met with her, who I believe was also a Mobilian, a white lady, um, she interviewed and sketched a number of them and also tells parts of their story in their, in their books. So that's why we have those documented story, uh, those documented truths. And it just speaks to the brilliancy of Cujo, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, him sitting with Zora Neale Hurston in 1927. I think that was a question. Uh, but it was like around 1927 when that interview was conducted. I have my book right here. <laughs> like I have it. I haven't read all of it. I've only read like a couple pages of it in so far, but I just chills just yeah. reading it and knowing that again, that it didn't come out for so long because they wanted to change it. And I was just how important that it wasn't changed Absolutely. in that. And it's having an that read. It's it's oh. an emotional read. I know the um the first time I read it, um, not only did I get chills, but I began to tear up because as I'm reading in his dialect, one thing that my grandmother was careful of and my great uncle Johnny was careful of is that when they shared stories to um, their descendants, they spoke in his dialect. And I remember as a little girl asking my grandmother, why, why are you talking like that? Um, because every time she would talk about him, she would change and speak in his dialect. And I was like, why are you talking like that? Like, they, like, that's not how we speak. And she would, you know, just crack a, a little smile and say, well, this is how he spoke. And that didn't resonate with me until I began to read Zora Neale Hurston's book. And I mean, just, you know, waterworks, because I was like, wow, oh, th this is him. This is him speaking. And even today, um, Cassandra Lewis, who is um, Alta Visa's relative, she's mm -hmm. very intentional about making certain yeah. that if you use or quote Cujo that you said in his words and his dialect. Yes. And for me, that's important because that family is very intentional. Um, Altavisa's family is very intentional about not allowing others to change who he was. Absolutely. Um, which is in my is is imp extremely important. So kudos to Altavis, kudos to Cassandra, Gary Lumbers, and everyone because they are very they are the memory keepers for mm -hmm. their family and they are the protectors of their family's history. Indeed. That's amazing. And just yeah. like thinking that like this, like the dialect that that has been preserved and it's not going to change and y'all are making sure that that's just yeah. like, I can't wrap my brain around that kind of thing. Like I just like liquid gold. 
It's like that's just fantastic. So, so with, what, what, like I yeah. said, being the elder statesman. Now, uh, <laughs> I have actually relatives that actually met Kujo. So my oldest um, aunt, who uh, passed last year, about ninety-five years old. So she was a little girl. She tells the story of actually meeting him and and uh, that he spoke in his dialect. And she tells the story of the, how he would go down to the uh, to the waterfront and often uh, moan or sing in his native tongue, longing uh, for trips back to Africa. So uh, I, I I have met people that actually met him or knew him. Uh, so it's um it's it's something that. Uh, that resonates with you when you actually know people that knew people and it's not myth. It's not folklore. Yeah. Uh, it gives mm -hmm. truth to the story. Yeah. I also think with that, it adds like, cause sometimes, especially with this, you'd be like, Oh, that was so long ago. That was so long ago. But when you're like, Oh wait, this person, knew this person and this miss, you're like, it right. wasn't that long ago. Right. Like, it truly wasn't. It brings it like kind of more to the reality. Absolutely. And that and that's important because again, um, I think so many folks try to distance themselves from slavery and they try to distance themselves from the transatlantic slave trade. But to that point, it's not that long ago. And that's why we have to continue to tell these stories and to sit in what they experience because folks need to know that and we have to continue to continue to to do that mm -hmm. so with what ways burning your ancestors experience whether it's the stories that have been passed down or doing the research on your ancestors has that affected like your personal identity and understanding your place in history now in this day and age well well first i'll, I'll take the, take the uh, question first um it, it is a source of pride knowing of their accomplishments. Uh, as Jeremy said, oftentimes people want to distance themselves from the story of the ancestors and slavery. Um, with, with me, it's a source of pride. It shows their intelligence, uh, their ability to, to navigate and survive under the harshest of conditions. And it, it's sad to say, but my place in history is only through the luck of my birth. Mm. And, and the uh, and the actions of those that uh, that took actions on my ancestors. So it's 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 the it's the luck of my birth. But what I do with it is more of my uh, under my control, as opposed to just my position and who I was born to and what have you. And I take that as as a uh, as a challenge always to do my best um, because of what they went through. Absolutely, Bill. And to, to add on to that, um, it also, for me, and, and I've um, uh, it attempted to instill this in my daughter, and I believe successfully, um, but it also um, helps me, has helped me to know that I don't have to buy into a false narrative of what someone says I am or who someone says I am or what I should be capable of. Um, it allows me to live above the fray, above the noise of others' limitations on people who look like me. Um, because I know through my lineage, if I know what's in me, right? Like I know that my people who were able to not only survive and attack on their village, to survive um, um, WIDA, to survive the transatlantic uh, passage, to survive enslavement, and then to not only come out of that, but to come out of that and thrive and to work with others to establish a community, to, to reestablish um, your culture, your governance, and to do all, to raise a family, to be successful and thrive. If that is in me, forget about it, right? I, I can do anything. Nothing that anyone says about someone that looks like me 
matters. It is inconsequential. It is, it is antithetical to what I know to be true about myself. And I mean, well said. I can there's nothing I can say that would top a hundred percent agree with Bill, but also how powerful Alta Beach just spoke. Um because I have a four-year-old daughter, it's important that I do the same. She's watching this now, so hello. Uh, and it's important that I do the same and remind her of that resiliency, that strength, and that courage that resides within her. Here's what we know. Two things. Um, we believe one, maybe even two, of the 110 didn't even make it over the transatlantic slave trade. So not all 110 actually arrived to Mobile. Um, and we know that through Captain Foster's diary, uh, which he kept a diary, and also through the interviews that, that were done of, of the survivors. But going back to Bill's point, um, we are part of that 1% of Black folk in America that can actually trace their lineage back to West Africa and know who their ancestors were. Okay. And to whom much is given, much is required. And so as descendants and as of, of the 110, we are also, there's a responsibility that comes with us having this level of information and sharing it and being those memory keepers and also correcting those that speak incorrectly about who our ancestors were and what they experienced. And so uh, when you look at the current climate here in America and how, and I spoke about this um, about a year ago, we're approaching a year about how history is trying to be rewritten, yeah. and how stories are being, um, or truths are being untold um, we have to debunk that and we have to be have the courage like our ancestors to speak up and tell their truth. And so because we have that privilege and because we have that uh, because we have that privilege is also a, a responsibility. Yeah. You're here. And with that, knowing that you are how you said, like that one percent that can trace back to the ship. And even knowing where in Africa that ship was that gathered your ancestors, how have y'all retained or like rediscover cultural practices or even traditions like making sure you're, if you're saying what Cujo said, it is in his dialect. Mm -hmm. Like how is that, how have y'all been able to retain that and maybe even rediscover it into practicing and continuing that today? So I'll say this and then each family probably has their own traditions and things that they do. As an organization, um, we have two annual events where we do that. Um, I mentioned the Spirit of Our Ancestors Festival, which um, we actually, and I'm going to actually take a step back because I typically do this. Um, it's important that folks know that the Clotilda, the Clotilda Descendants Association is a child organization to the original descendants organization, which was known as the Africa Town Direct Descendants of Clotilda, which was founded in 1984. Now, why is that important? That's important because those descendants who founded that organization was telling this story and remembering this story Yes. before the international and national attention it got from the finding of Clotilda. Decades. So this is, a, this Decades. is a story that has been told yeah. for years. Yeah. It just didn't have the That's world. The global attention. The global attention because of a <laughs> ship yeah. had not been found, found in, uh, yet. So, and they actually would have a day called Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks don't know that, but I have a program from 2000, from the early 2000s that speak to Remembrance Day. And so descendants have been telling this story for decades. Yeah. 
the world just wasn't listening. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the world is kind of listening. Caught up. <laughs> yeah, the world is caught up, but in their catching up, yeah. they're still distracted by that ship. And so yeah. as descendants, we have to continuously fight the narrative of the ship yes. and redirect people back to the true essence of this particular um, history, yes. which is that of the 110th. Yes. So I needed to give you that prerequisite before I answer your question. <laughs> so to answer your question, <laughs> today we are, uh, we have the Spirit of Our Ancestors Festival um, that takes place annually. Joyce Lynn Davis, a direct descendant of Charlie Lewis, she is the co-founder of that, as well as committee lead and Ms. Pat um, Frazier. And they are responsible for having that annually. We invite everyone in Charleston and those listening out. Um, I mentioned the play An Ocean in My Bones. Um, that tells the story. And the thing about that play is that each of our ancestors speak from their voice. Yes. And that's the power of that story. And yes. so, I mean, of that play written and directed by Terrence Spivey. So we do that annually. We also have what I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Bill Green, who came up with the idea of what is now known, and he named it The Landing. Um, the Landing is a annual event we have um, each July, July the 8th around that time, this year is on July the 6th, where we honor our ancestors and each family has the opportunity to share about their ancestor. And so that's another event that we have. We started the landing um, in, uh, I think, 2019, 2020. Bill yeah, Green is the, Bill Green is the um, founder, organizer. And so that's another way that we continuously tell that story. Yeah, you, you, you ask about the uh, cultural practices and traditions. Um, as I said, I'm a native of Africatown. Africatown, so named by those 30 to 32 of the Clotilda ancestors who started Africatown and, give, and gave it that name to honor the continent from which they, they came. So uh, growing up in Africatown, it, it uh, was a haven for a lot of the African practices that they brought over, especially agriculturally. Uh, O.C. Kibi, my great-grandfather, um, it is reported that Booker T. Washington actually visited with them, uh, Booker T. Washington of Tuskegee Institute, visited with them and other Africans there in the neighborhood because of some of their uh, agricultural techniques, uh, as well as some of the, the trees that was planted. Uh, Africa Town was a bevy of different fruit trees, fig trees, walnut trees, pecan trees that we had in our backyards. So uh, now a lot of them probably didn't come from Africa, but they had these uh, agricultural techniques that they was able to refine. The uh, the the neighborhood was was just a bevy of, of fruit trees and, and planting. Uh, I don't uh, first few years of my life, I don't think we ever bought anything from a grocery store. It was all grown <laughs> in the neighborhood. And, and of course, and they did share with one another too. Yeah. That was the other thing. It was a community go. It was a community uh, aspect of it that uh, they would share with the others in the neighborhood so that it was uh, truly a village aspect of growing up there. Absolutely. And and to add on to what Bill was saying, um, you know, the uh, the ancestors, three dozen, um, established Africatown. And they did that so that they could bring Africa to the United States. When they realized that they were not going to be successful in returning to their homeland, they decided we're going to bring it here. And in Africa town, they were able to reestablish their cultural practices, you know, their their sense and source of governance, um, medicine, the way that they, you know, were able to treat um illness, minor illnesses. Um, my great grandmother, who I was also fortunate enough 
to, um, I was a, a adolescent when she passed away. So I was able to, you know, visit with her. She lived in Africa. I'm a native of Mobile. She lived in Africa town. She lived in the house that Kudjo built for his family. So, you know, I was in that home and, you know, she would share with me, you know, and I would sit, you know, when she and my grandmother and my mother would speak and they would talk about, you know, little practices with, with medicine and, you know, red clay dirt and mixing it with this and, you know, putting, using it as a salve and, and all kinds of things um, there before, at least before um, Kajo um, began his um, Christian walk, he and other members practice voodoo. Um, that is something that, that is a, that those are religious practices that my family members still know about that I have learned. Um, and you know, I'm a Christian, however, I do know about my ancestors practices. And that's something that I share with my daughter. I share with my nieces and my nephews. So, um, I think for all of us as a collective, um, but certainly for uh, my family, we have continued to share in the same, we've continued to share our history and our practices in the same way that our ancestors shared with us, right? You know, that's how we not only continue to keep our history alive, and I love, Jeremy, that you you stop calling it a story because it's not a story, it's a truth, it's a history. That's how we continue to keep our history alive. That's how we continue to pass on our practices in the same way that they did through our oral histories. And I had to... I had to get credit where credit is due. Um, the truth aspect of this comes from Carlos Finley because he was like, this is a truth, not a story. So exactly. I definitely credit Carlos for educating me on the truth of the 110. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, uh, I think we have, let's, let's sit here for a second because for me, I think it's important that we understand that these the 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 thirty two that founded Africa Town, um, they were all they were from different some were from different tribes. The one ten of Boric Latilda, they all were not from the same tribe, which okay. means they spoke different dialects. Yeah, but they became shipmates because of what they experienced, and as shipmates, um, when they arrived. We know that about 32 founded Africa Town, and the other 78 or so were in various other areas of, of Alabama. Selma, Dallas County being one, that's where Matilda McCrary. I'm learning about the group that went to G's Bend, yeah. uh, which Hannah Durkin, Professor Hannah Durkin, has an upcoming book out that's going to tell. A point, uh, I think she has a chapter that tells that particular story, but just understanding that they were not all from the same location, they were from different tribes, and when they founded Africa Town, there was 32, some of that, um, they were a collective group, and they understood the importance of having to work together. Yes. Altavis mentioned this, but their original plan was was to go back. They actually approached, when they learned of their freedom, April 12, 1865, they actually approached Timothy Mayer and asked to return um, back to Africa, right? They wanted to go back. He continued to raise the price of, of them going back. And then when they realized they couldn't purchase their way back, they asked them for land. So... He, he wouldn't give them the land, so eventually they would purchase their own land from him mm -hmm. and build their homes together and and work together and grow vegetables and share those within their collective. But, I mean, I just wanted to sit there to understand that imagine you being on a ship or being with a group of people not speaking their language, but eventually having to learn how to communicate, develop your own governing body, right? Because they had their own governing body within um, their community, uh, those 32, and and essentially becoming a family. Yeah. That's just amazing. The like coming from those different areas and going across and just how you just put it together, coming together and basically mm -hmm. becoming a family and everything. I also like how you pointed out saying that like 
they were just passed down. So y'all knew about it. Like it was just like, basically it was just normal life. Like that was just life for y'all. And us, the rest of the world is now catching up because of the national and international news with the ship. How like I even told y'all before we started, I learned about y'all by just buying a book in Barnes and Noble that I was like, ooh, I want to read this. <laughs> and then being like, why did I not know any of this? And just yeah. going down that rabbit hole and like kind of being mad that I didn't know this till now mm. in a sense. So yeah, the, the, the finding of the of the ship is somewhat of a double edged sword. Yeah. Um, yes, we we recognize the historical and archaeological significance of the find, but our focus has to be more on the human cargo, our ancestors who survived the journey and conditions uh, on the Clotilda. Yeah. Uh, now, we will forever be linked to the Clotilda. We carry it in our name, the Clotilda Descendants Association, not to honor the ship, more to honor the, the origin of our ancestors than honoring the ship. Mm -hmm. so with the ship bringing that national international attention how personally did y'all feel once the ship was discovered and I know I'm trying to think was it a couple months ago that I I saw a news article pop up that the water got low enough that like a piece of it was above the water like just how like what was that feeling so, well, so let me correct you. Let me as, 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 let me as, as, correct as, as, you on that on that on that last piece. Okay. <laughs> that was that 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 story was not accurate. Um, unfortunately, that story that moved fast, <laughs> and because of how fast it moved, it was unfortunately reported. But that was not the case. So right. Clotilde is twenty feet underwater. That was actually. Um, another wreck. So for those that are not familiar with the story, where Cotilda resides is actually in a great a ship graveyard. Mm -hmm. So it's known as a ship graveyard. Um, and a number of different ships are in that area. And unfortunately, the ship that was reported as being Clotilda was actually Lake Elegy, which has its own story within itself. For those that are interested, you can go and read about its involvement in translated slave trade. But that was not Clotilda. But to answer your question, um, how did we? How did I feel? Because I can only speak for myself, and that's important that I'm not speaking on behalf of the organization. But um, for me, it's it's really been more of a at that particular time to just pause and see, um, mm -hmm. and not overreact but just let's um because we've been telling this story i mentioned earlier i've already known that this is right this was the truth <laughs> right my grandmother was the previous president of the original organization who had me involved in the different activities and remembrance day and things that they were doing so for me this was just confirmation to something we had already been trying to educate others on and all to be summed it up the world just caught up to us so that's kind of how I felt and now we continuously from my perspective have to re change the narrative back to the people Bill was just talking about that but um, it's not about that ship it's about those people and so let's not allow the ship to control the narrative, let's allow those who occupy the ship to be the narrative and to continuously tell that story. So that's how I felt and that's how I feel today is yeah. to continue to have to debunk those stories that try to change the narrative of, of, the, of, of what this is really about. Now, one thing it has done though, uh, the, with the finding of the ship, it has brought more attention to our story and our ancestor story. Mm -hmm. So as I said, it's somewhat of a double-edged sword. Uh, so so the benefit that we have of it has brought more attention to us. Hence, we're on this uh, on your program today. It <laughs> probably would not have been, but it was able with the finding of the uh, of the ship, it brought, gave us a, a forum where we could seize the narrative and redirect the attention from the church, uh, from the ship to the people that our ancestors that came on the ship. So it's uh so it 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 was a, a small Benny 
but we, we're trying to seize on that opportunity that has supported us for sure. Absolutely. And and to add to that, the discovery of the ship is more of a discovery for those outside of the Alabama area, um, especially outside of Mobile, because um we and our ancestors have always known where the ship was. <laughs> that is true. Right? That is true. Right? So, you know, we we knew, and again, something else that we were told through the generations, um, when the ship was intentionally sunken, we knew where it was sunken. So the, the ship's location is really more of a worst kept secret than anything else. Um and so it's discovery, and I and I, you know, use air quotes for discovery because again, we have known where it it has been the whole time. Um, has really just, in my opinion, served to squash the detractors, those who have said this didn't happen, these people did not, you know, come here during that time, do this during in this way. Um, so it was really for me more of a, okay, now you all have no leg to stand on anymore because here is now the, here is now additional documented proof that this crime occurred. Um, so for me, you know, it was more of a, okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks for that correction, Jeremy, because I probably wouldn't have known that. So I appreciate that. Because, <laughs> yeah, that did go fast. <laughs> it, it did, and <laughs> we tried to correct it as, as best we could. Yeah, and to me, I feel like it was just, y'all knew it, and it was over. It was just more for everyone else who maybe needed that physical thing or be like the naysayers that like be like, okay, now what are you going to say kind of a thing? Be like, your point's gone next kind of attitude towards it yeah. to have for it so with the attention you know we've talked about the barracoon book um the last slave ship book by ben rhymes the different information y'all have done the national geographic documentary the now netflix documentary that all came out a couple years ago how has that impacted y'all and with all of that now more attention that has come to the association, what more are y'all doing now with that? Well, under the current leadership of Clotilda Descendants Association, we are trying to leverage that, the national media and the media attention we've gotten to number one, bring more awareness like we're doing today, but also have those conversations with descendants of Timothy Mayer and with those estates. So uh, there was a 60 Minutes piece that aired where we spoke with the Mayer family, but this could be an example of what reconciliation mm -hmm. and healing looks like. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping to continue those conversations with them, but I also think this is an opportunity for the U.S. government, Congress, to be intentional about reparations, uh, be intentional about the injustices that were, um, that our ancestors experienced. And so there's a lot of work ahead of us um, around reconciliation and healing. I think what this has allowed descendants to do, I, I didn't speak on the healing piece, but um, descendants have had an opportunity to talk with descendants of the Mayor family mm -hmm. and form their own individual, ask those questions and and begin to heal however that, that is for them. And so um, I can tell you how impactful that has been for a few of the descendants having the opportunity to pose questions with descendants of the Mir family and start that healing process if that's what they if that's what they would like to do. So those are a few of the things that we've been able to do um, through the attention. And 
we're looking to do more. Yeah, absolutely. The the attention also uh, shines a light on the um, environmental and social injustices on the Africatown community, right? Like, you know, we know that this was a booming community um, that our ancestors established and then their descendants later um, carried on. And now it has, um, through um, uh, pollution, and through again the the choking out of resources and um and the intentional choking out of resources um it it has now uh, disintegrated into a an unrecognizable community and so the attention now allows folks to say oh okay this this injustice is occurring, how can I now step in? You know, I, I am a this, I am a that, I have this skill set. How can I come alongside of the CDA and, or, and other organizations to rebuild this community? And not only back to what it once was, but into the 21st century community that it should be. That's a good point. Sharing our platform with the, with the rep, uh, it has also allowed us to share the platform that we as descendants have received with the residents of Africatown and um, partner with them where we can and, and also allow them to, um, to, to get the needs and the things that they want to see in their community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what kind of, I guess, efforts or what are happening in Africa Town or as y'all are doing as an association to preserve and honor the memory and sharing it with people. So like if someone would go to like Africa Town or Mobile, is there anything where they can learn more or just kind of be like, oh, this is the spot kind of stuff? So great question. And I'll kick us off and then I'll allow our resident Africa Town uh, former residents to, to, to elaborate. But on July, the weekend of July the 8th of 2023, we actually, um, the Heritage House was open. Heritage House, we partnered with the Mobile County. I have to first just shout out Commissioner Marcia Luggood, mm -hmm. who is the godmother of Africa Town. She has championed all things Africa Town, as well as um, Mobile um, History Museum specifically Meg Fowler, who once was um, leading that um, that museum, historic, the uh, his, uh, Mobile History Museum. Um, and we partner with those groups to tell our story. So the Heritage House um, was, went live in the weekend of July the 8th of 2023. That the Heritage House has an exhibit called um, Clotilda, which tells the stories of our ancestors. It's actually well done. I invite uh, Dr. Matthews had the opportunity to visit um, the Heritage House. And so we welcomed her and she was given a personalized tour by some of the descendants. And so that's one way for those that are interested to come down and learn more about our ancestors story. Um, there are also different tours, Africa Town Freedom Tours, um, where Lamar Howard, uh, uh, Keita Howard, uh, Joycelyn Davis, who partners with them to take you around Africa Town and show you some in both in Mobile and the Pritchard area and show you some of the areas of Africa Town that we promote as well as the um, Franklin, Dora Franklin Tour. That's another company that does a tour in Africa Town. So there are a number of different tours that you can partner with. Um, we are looking to also have at some point an experience opportunity with descendants where you can um, meet with descendants specifically and work with them and, and learn more about their ancestors or the community. So um, those are some of the things that exist today. Um, there are other organizations in the community that are doing work that we partner with as well. Um, 
and you can learn more about those from our website. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, I know you you once lived there, so you may have more to add. Well, I, I, the only thing I, I would add is that I, I'd, I'd like to set expectations of those that perhaps would like to visit. Um, as as Jeremy shared, I was born and raised in Africa Town, attended Mobile County Training School, one of the first uh, schools in Alabama formed to educate African Americans uh, secondarily. And uh, also lived in a section of, of Africa Town called the New Quarters, as I said so named as a euphemism for the new slave quarters. And it's my belief that that was one of the first landing place of those Africans that were freed because it was still land owned by uh, Timothy Mayer. They were paying rent to him. Shotgun homes, so-called shotgun homes, you fire a shotgun in the front and it goes straight through to the back and not hit anything. Um, so it was, it was still land owned by him. They was still paying rent to him. And it was close proximities to some of the mills that he ran, the paper mills, the uh, the wood mills, so they could work and earn uh, earn money to eventually buy the land. Uh, but after town, when I grew up, uh, it was a vibrant community. And all to these mentioned about the environmental uh, injustice that is currently experienced. But once again, it was a it was a. Uh, a good and bad. It, it was bad that we didn't realize the uh, the impact that it was having on our health there, the conditions there. But yet at the same time, it provided uh, one of the most healthiest job opportunities for people in Africa town. Most of them worked at international sky paper company, Venus bag. So it was even though they were paid much less than their white counterparts, these were uh, almost jobs that could elevate them up. And to mm -hmm. the first stages of middle class, mm -hmm. um, it's it was a vibrant community at one time. Twelve uh, about a population of twelve thousand unified through the uh, Mobile County Training School, the Whippets, uh, one of the few schools that has carried a mascot that I knew in America it was another up in Oklahoma. But uh, we was of course everything sometimes unified through athletics in the school. So it was a vibrant unified community that eventually, as most uh, communities experience, uh, succeeding generations seek their fortunes and education elsewhere. So it's it started to uh, deteriorate because through natural progression. Uh, I myself, I, you, you go away to school, you, you don't come back to the community. Uh, and then the, the, the industry around it started uh, changing and it became more polluting. So it became less of an attractive area to to, um, to visit, to move in, to stay. So wanted to set those expectations of those people that may want to visit it. It, it is nothing like it was when I grew up there. Now it is it is uh, experienced the um, the uh, the environmental injustice, the uh, the social economic movements in there. So. Uh, I think the the population of Africa Town now is maybe only about a thousand, less than a thousand people in that area. When once it was uh, 11, 12,000. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we used to have all everything was self sufficient. Yeah. We had our drive-ins, movie theaters, restaurants, uh, hotels, motels. Uh, uh, that was a uh, that was a vibrant little community, and it was one that we all knew one another. But one of the good things that the Clotilde Descendants Association is doing is it's it's helping to us to recognize those that were descendants. I mean, yeah. I went to school with people. I have cousins, right. second, and third cousins that I didn't even know were my you know, right. Yeah, establishing connections. And yeah, absolutely. Attending high school together, not knowing that we because it was it was something that was it was just never discussed. It was right. something innate. You knew it. My family knew it. I knew I was a descendant, but it was nothing that was there was no program. To talk about there. or share. Yeah. There was there was no but but so through this organization, we've uh, we've come to inform, correct stories, and build that bond and unify us, at least let let us recognize one another, those that share this this in our in our in our past or in our future as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. We've all learned a lot from the audience. I know I have just been sitting here and soaking it all in. We're now going to take the questions that have been 
asked throughout the discussion in the Q&A. And Shelly, do you want to start with the first one? I sure will. This has been amazing. I want to say that in case I don't get to say it at the end. It's been amazing. And we truly appreciate all of you being here. So Stephen Hammond had a question. Did any of the Cotilda ship logs survive? The so yes, um, and also that great question. First, let me just say thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, and I actually reside in the Atlanta area, and a number of those logs and things are available at the archive here in, in the Atlanta area. Uh, there's a great report put out by um, Professor Delgado where they reference the laws and Captain Foster's diary. So your the actual documents are available at the um at those that are that are still available are are available at the archive. Mm -hmm. Um you can actually reach out to them and they actually PDF the number of them. Uh, or you can read the report that is available online that Professor James Delgado did that talks about um, and, and references these logs. Now, I, I was first introduced to, uh, to the logs of the Clotilde by a classmate of mine. I attended Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. And um, when it became known about the Clotilde and one of their classmates was a descendant, um, yours truly, uh, they reached out to me, and one of one of my classmates uh, was a captain uh, with the United States Coast, Coast Guard, and they had digitized a number of records for all of the ships as, as far back as they had the records. So, so he first introduced me to this digitized records of the ship Clotilda, uh, the logs of the Clotilda. A lumber, they show where it, it moved back and forth between Mobile, New Orleans, Mobile, Cuba, uh, and some say it was kind of trying to hide what they eventually was going to do. But the, the the actual trip to Africa, because it was against the law, there's no log of it. They were supposedly going to Bermuda. So right. now the things we learned about um, what they stocked the ship with, their trip to Africa, and, and um, a lot of that comes from uh, Captain Foster's mm -hmm. diary or his write-up that uh, we have copies of at the Mobile Public Library. The first time I, we were introduced to it, uh, to it uh, at a Kibi family reunion, the kids went and made copies of, of his uh, handwritten uh, diary of that, or a recollection of it, because he didn't actually uh, keep it at that time. He recounted it back in, I think it was 1890, some 30 years after the event, telling about what the stock was, what uh, the things that they encountered, a lot of which is now Kind of documented as part of that history of of the uh, of that uh, of going to Africa, bringing them back, and our ancestors being brought back to uh, the Mobile. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, uh, Marco Cornelius. Question says, how has the association safeguarded against the Cotilda becoming a tourist destination? that benefits everyone else except the descendants. <laughs> I remember in the documentary, a black resident expressed her concern about that. Mm -hmm. I saw the fear in her eyes and couldn't blame her because it happens time and time when our communities are edged out of our own histories. Have you heard of the stories of unmarked graves in St. Helena? But I'll have you respond to the other question. And she also made comment, uh, there's great lessons here. Great question. Yeah. Uh, and we're actively trying to pre prevent that from happening. Um, because if you were seeing signs from my perspective as president of uh, that happening where everyone is benefiting mm -hmm. except for all descendants and all residents who reside there. I recently attended um, a conversation hosted by 
Costas Christ around trying to put safeguards in place for um, those in the Black Belt area and Africa town, so Selma and Mobile area. And we're actively trying to do that um, because Great. I do see that being a, a great issue for descendants and the residents, the people who are most impacted benefiting the least yeah. from from what's taking place. So it's something that we're actively actively learning. Also, if there's anything you want to add there, because you see it as mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, you, you, you landed it right. Like, I mean, we know that because this is a, <laughs> no pun intended, fast moving ship, um, that, and, and because the people who, um, are impacted by this story, the, the residents of Africatown, the descendants, you know, we're, we're still, you know, grappling with the attention and, and how to navigate that successfully. Um, there are so many things that are happening at, at one time. It, it's, it is difficult to, to grab hold of, okay, we see that, uh, we, we see what you're trying to do and no. So, I mean, we, we're in process, but because there are so many um, avenues um, that this could happen, like it's 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 a lot for us, right? Like, and and we're we're learning this. I, you know, we're building the plane as we're flying it, so to speak. So, um, you know, we're as Jeremy said, we're we're in conversations with folks. Um, you know, fortunately, there are other entities that are you know willing to come alongside of us and say, hey, you know, this is these are some of the things that you should do. These are some of the things that you should be mindful of. Um, but um, we um, would appreciate any additional support. <laughs> yeah, it's, we have to call it out. That's So I think yeah. two things we have done is we are aware that is that we're not naive to the fact or gullible to the fact of what's happening. Right. And because we are aware and we are being intentional about, hey, this is our story and mm -hmm. figuring out how we also benefit from that. So um Altavis also nailed it with uh, we're building a plane as we go so any additional resources are welcomed um and we'll continue to call it out when we see it because yeah. we have to do that um and and we'll continue to do, to do that as well yeah thank you for that and i also had posted in the chat the link that if people would like to donate towards this legacy and memory preservers and uh, memory keepers, um, there is a donate button and I on your website as well. So we only have a couple more questions, and one of them and and, have... and not to pass over that. That's important. Donate. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to rush past that. Bill Green can speak to. And, and I am I'm the treasurer, so yeah. <laughs> the yeah. yeah. We're always looking for donations and looking for yes. things yeah. to. I mean, there are a number of things we want to do, right? And so we have a number of, we have our annual events that we mentioned. Sure. The, the Spirit of Ancestors Festival and the Landing, which are annual cost operating. And we have our regular operating expenses that we deal with. Uh, but then there are things that we have vision for. Yeah. Um, scholarships for descendants. Um, traveling back to Africa annually for descendants and so there are a number of land um and redevelopment in africa town so there are a number of aspirational goals we have mm -hmm. so i don't want to run past the I'll, I'll keep I, I we'll keep putting it out just just <laughs> as well so i appreciate that so <laughs> dr ellen fernando Sacco, who's a very good friend of mine she, her question is should historians have an obligation to connect with descendant communities? Um, Bill, you want to take that? I can if you don't. Uh, oh, almost definitely. Uh, all history is important. Exactly. Uh, history history um, sets the stage of who we are 
who we were as a people, uh, political environment, political climate, economic climate. Without weaving all of that together, uh, any piece of it can be lost. Mm -hmm. So all histories are lo uh, is important. And as we recently saw, uh, the, um, the former governor of, of your state wanted to leave out one aspect, perhaps, of, yes. of the Civil War. So uh, in, in what that eventually does, that deteriorates the truth. Um, and... And we have to get away from this notion of protecting or trying to say we're protecting a certain group of people. I mean, right. that two-year-old girl that was in the cargo hall of Clotilda, that happened. Exactly. And who's that protecting is, her? And and who protected her? And so we we can't shy away from from facts. Mm -hmm. We have to share the facts and what actually happened. And because it's going to impact or someone feels as though we have to, we have to, we have to speak truth to power. And yeah. so what Matilda McCrary expresses and shares about as a two-year-old being in a cargo hole, clinging to her mother because of the moaning and groaning and the smell and yeah. vomiting and experiencing one of their shipmates dying, maybe two, that happened. Mm -hmm. That's factual. And so we have to share those things as they are and speak truth to power. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, descendant history is American history. So how, as a historian, can you accurately depict or share if you are not going to a source. We are sources. So yes, absolutely. In order to tell, in order to accurately tell the American history, you must seek out descendants. And we also have to speak, we also have to, to share if those that benefited from yes. free labor, we have to we have to tell it like it is. Like yes. I mean the mere family who we sat across the table with benefited their ancestors benefited from the um from this from this truth and so um there's no way to deny that and so right. they have to acknowledge that part of history um and we have to we have to tell that so um yes we should historians definitely should connect to those descendant communities mm -hmm. in history is now as well. And sure. and you guys are making history now, keeping this legacy alive. And so we've got a question. Uh, Margot Cornelius did put a link in someone she's trying to connect you with, and you can grab that, uh, Jeremy. And I'm going to go to the conference room at the International African American Museum. One of the questions says, how many Africans survived the journey? Well, as I mentioned, um, we believe one and maybe even two did not make, they joined the two million that did not make the transatlantic slave trade. So um, at least 108, maybe 109 survived the journey. And Whitney, I'm going to turn it back over to you. That is all the questions that I saw. And if the panelists would glance through the chat, a lot of comments, yeah. emotional, mm -hmm. appreciative for what you shared. And um, hopefully we can do this again and follow up on things. So Whitney, I'll turn it back over to you. I just want to say thank y'all for joining us today and thank the people who spent their Saturday afternoon for almost two hours with us yes. to sit and talk about this conversation and the people in the conference room at the International African American Museum. Thank you for stopping by and listening on your visit to the museum. And if there was any way for someone who wants to contact you, whether for more information or wanting to know more, y'all can just kind of either put it in the chat or say where to go. I added it to the chat. Um, okay. I'll add it again. It's president at the Clotilda story .com, um, or 
you can type in info at the Clotilda story.com and you can shoot us an email. We're always available. Um, looking to partner with other organizations who want to partner with us. Always fundraising. It's important that we continue to have operational funds as well as um, inspirational funds. So if you all could could donate, you can go to theclotildastory.com. That's www.theclotildastory.com. And you can click on the donate button there to donate. But um, we're grateful for the opportunity yes. um, to share our ancestors' story. Thank you to the International African American Museum. Thank you to Dr. Matthews for your um, leadership as well as partnership. And to Jessica, I gotta say sh sh hello to Jessica. Social, you all, social media person who connected us with you, Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, and for this opportunity to do the webinar. So come out, join us in Mobile. Yes. The Spirit of Our Ancestors Festival. So Absolutely. thank you all. Thank you all. We appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Whitney, I'd like to just share, uh, tune in for each Saturday in February during Black History Month. Uh, the Center for Family History at the International African American Museum will host webinars all pertaining to African Americans and military from the Revolutionary War up until today. So same time, third Saturday of the month, you'll see the schedule. Go ahead, Jeremy. No, I was going to say hello to everyone in the conference room. I just think that's so, so, so cool. Isn't that amazing? I yes. just think that's so cool that you all broadcast this yeah. to those that are actually attending the museum today. It's what a way to spend Saturday afternoon. It I is. Think. That's pretty cool. So for those yeah. that stuck around for the full time, even to those that just peeked their head in, yeah. hello. From the Clotilda <laughs> Descendants Association. Hello from Africa Town, USA, Mobile, Alabama. And mm -hmm. thank you all for joining us. It's it's great.